Okay, so I'm here with James Reed the Readers, um, and we're focusing on a dialogue targeting strength and conditioning athletes uh, this afternoon. And one of the things that we wanted to do was provide a philosophical slash theological type corner, if you will, for for those athletes out there who want to join us. And we invite a uh, larger group think or group mind, if you will, build up the community um, as big as it can, as big as it can be. Because the more thought we have out there, the more people want to share with us, the more we can all learn. Right. Um, because you know some of the greatest teachers have been willing learners yeah. throughout history. Anyway, so James here uh, has a master's in mental health and also a master's in uh, behavioral science. Psychology. Yeah. And psychology. And, you know, in, in my mind, that's equivalent to, you know, a terminal degree or a, or a doctoral degree. So, uh, you know, I appreciate him being willing to uh, uh, bring what he has to the table on these, on these subjects. Anyway, so... I wanted to pose a, or introduce a topic, pathology, and okay. toss that on the table. Yeah. And human behavior and how we respond or don't respond, and, mm -hmm. and some of the things that um, help us basically reflect on ourselves. So go ahead and, right. if you would, introduce that. So, um, you know, in, in terms of pathology, especially the more relevant pathologies today, I think uh, so much what we see, uh, especially with, with social media, and it's not something I know that we want to focus on too heavily, but it's it's something you can't really ignore nowadays, talking about pathology, because um, they are just self-comparison machines, you know, social media is, and, and a lot of what we see um, is this development of what we call an external locus of control, um, and, and, and especially in young people we're seeing a vast increase in suicidal behavior and um, in, in anxiety and depression. Um, and a lot of that comes from, you know, always focusing on uh, uh, the evaluations of the crowd. You know, am I getting likes? Am I getting attention? And also, look at this other person getting attention and getting likes. And um, so, so the, the external locus of control that, that develops because of that uh, a lot of what we're seeing is people feel like they constantly need approval and reassurance and reinforcement. Um, and it's, um, it doesn't bode well uh, from, from a psychological perspective because so much of what we're after when we're working with, with, with people in therapy is the development of assertiveness skills, but also the development of an internal locus of control feeling like you can be more self-affirming, uh, uh, developing a level of self-efficacy and self-respect so that, you know, what other people are doing in their lives is not something that is there for you to be jealous of or, or to find yourself comparing yourself to. Uh, it's, it's something that you can actually look at and be happy for them, like legitimately, you know, feel good for them uh, uh, for doing what they're doing. And it's like, so, so what we see, I think, especially in the world of, of, of strength these days, is that um, there is a, um, a push greater than ever for uh, instant gratification and, and approval. And uh, you know, when, what we see in my profession is that delayed gratification is one of the top three indicators of success behind uh, intelligence quotient and um, conscientiousness. So. You know, it does absolutely pay to be able to delay gratification so that you can manage, you know, the things that come up, the adversity that comes up in the world. So, yeah. yeah. And how principally is that related uh, to, to biblical principle in the Torah and, and right. the Yeshua Jesus taught, you know, uh, not that which enters into the man defiles him, but that which comes out. Right. In other words, from the inside out. Right, right. Uh, and self-reflection and, and, you know, for all of us, 
me included. And again, you know, we're not professing to be, you know, theological, spiritual giants, nope. or philosophical giants. We're just trying to stimulate dialogue, targeting strength athletes. So, right. But that being said, mm -hmm. you're talking about a great point on delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. And Rabbi Shaul, or later became known as the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, he talks about, you know, keeping his body under subjection, mm -hmm. and he likens it to, uh, in a parallel passage in Hebrew, to running a race, right. uh, and at the same time in Corinthians, shadow boxing. Right. And then in Ephesians chapter 6, where he says, we wrestle not mm -hmm. against flesh and blood, right. you know, but against principalities and spiritual things. So right. there's a multifaceted universe out there, entities that are influencing us to mm -hmm. focus on the externals mm -hmm. and not focus on the internals. Right. And, uh, you know, the very place that, that Yeshua was victorious was a place called Gagulet or Golgotha. Okay. which is the place of the skull, yeah. you know, and yeah. the skull houses the brain, the mind. Right. So right. the mind is the battlefield. It sure you is. Know? And, uh, wow, I mean, continue, please, on that, you know, that's... Right. You know, you said a, you said a few things there. Uh, number one, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the quote about what comes out to files. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, Carl Rogers said, uh, Rogers was what we would refer to as a secular humanist. Um, Rogers talked about congruence being one of the, the main components of therapy, the core conditions of therapy, or a, of a therapeutic relationship, basically any relationship. But in order to be congruent, you had to be not just consistent uh, in, in, in your, your actions, but you had to be consistent between your beliefs and your actions. So you had to act out what it was that you said that you believed. And if there was any kind of incongruence, you know, that, that in some ways we would be pathologizing ourselves. And, and in, you know, I see that in, in my practice all the time. I mean, I think it's become such a cliche, this idea that uh, the truth shall set you free. But what you see in, in, in my profession is that the people that, I got a fly on me like Mike Pence right now. <laughs> the, the, people that, uh, the people that resist uh, uh, the reality, the people that deny their reality, the people that are incongruent suffer the most. So it's like you want to get in line with your reality. You want to you want to see things as truthfully and realistically as you can, and, or, and you have to in order to progress because it's just a, it's not, it's a non-starter. You're not moving from that point unless you can do that and start to be honest with your your circumstances and your situation and 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 being congruent is also something that inspires trust in other people because if you're emotionally congruent with people, if you're consistently who you are with them and, and uh, you know, your actions and beliefs are, are aligned, they're, gonna, they're going to trust you more. They're not gonna have to try really hard to figure out what you're up to because you know, you're, you're wearing it, you know, sure. you're acting it out. So, so uh, uh, that is, is, is uh, to, to, your, to your first quote there and then the second one had me thinking about um, uh, the the idea that the battle is within, and I can't remember who said it, but uh, it was that part of the challenge is to stay sane, you know, because you know we're going to encounter suffering in our life, we're going to encounter adversity, we're going to encounter loss, so we're going to have a lot that we have to grieve, um, and and part of our challenge is to not let it destroy us. Because in many ways, I mean, it's not that hard to do to allow something that, that creeps into your life uh, to destroy you. And, and, and it's one of the reasons why we need to develop distress tolerance is to be able to, you know, manage those things that, that come up, even if there are things that, you know, internally affect us deeply that, uh, you know, like you said, I mean, uh, it is within the mind. The battle is definitely within the mind. So, which I think actually for, for, for me is what attracts me to, to strength related sports to begin with, you know, it's that what you do physically obviously is very important, but the hardest part is to do it mentally, especially in, in, in terms of delayed gratification and 
the self-doubt you go through and the plateaus you hit and uh, the losses you endure at events. Um, you, you have to be able to manage it, um, you know, extract information from the negative feelings that come up with it, and then sort of, you know, move forward. Has that been your experience? It has, you know, and, and the first person that came to mind when you, when you talked about, you know, enduring the, the hardships and the losses and the suffering was, you know, Job, the mm -hmm. first two chapters of Job, just spinning it a little bit theologically. Right. Uh, it unveils literally, you know, the entire universe or universes of what is going on behind the scenes that we don't necessarily see with the human eye, but yet that influence or can be an influence on us if we allow it to. If right. We allow it to. So, uh, but how important is the delayed gratification thing, the, the, the denial of self? You know, and, and again, getting back to Paul, likening it to an athlete or even a soldier in Timothy. Mm -hmm. You know, he says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Yeshua, mm -hmm. the Messiah. Right. You know, and, and then so, you know, you get into the, the importance of, in military training, the first thing you want to do is shock these young men or young women into the realities of war. Right. You know, and, right. and, but. That's important so, mentally too. Yeah. Because uh, so often what we see, and I've, I've worked with actually a lot of people with post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm more or less a trauma therapist. Um, uh, I do EMDR and trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. So many of the people who come back who are traumatized, who have PTSD, a lot of it was they might have had ideals about war that caused them a, a, a great deal of naivety. And then they actually went into war and they had to witness it for what it was. And that left an unbelievably indelible mark on them to the point where, you know, their fight or flight instincts are always on. You know, they can never really take it easy because they were just so shocked. I mean, their whole perspective of the world changed you know, in, in a matter of sometimes split seconds. And, uh, and it, you know, they actually got to see how uh, uh, fragile, you know, human life can be and how seriously dark and evil and horrible war can be and what human beings can do to other human beings, which is, uh, yeah, yeah, troubling. That's human history in many ways. You know, it's true. And, and one of the, you know, one of the, the teachings of the hyper Calvinists, we'll say, uh, is uh, total depravity of humanity. I don't agree with that. I don't see that in, in the Bible, but that was their extraction of it. Right. And, but there is a point at, at which we can look at some of the things that humans have done to us and say, you know, sure. there are some bad stuff that right. humans have done to other humans that, that, and bad things that have happened to good people and sure you know so that's the hardest one for religious people to explain away yeah and myself how many times I have somebody that sits in front of me and says I feel like I made all the right sacrifices I did all the right things why am I being completely leveled by this tragic situation and it's like there's there's no good answer for that it's no. not it's not an easy thing to explain away. I don't think it's something that we're intended to explain away at all. You know, I think, uh, and I know there's obviously a biblical reference to this, but but uh, one one of the things that Kierkegaard had said was he talked about how you know there are no guarantees that you know whatever leap of faith you take is going to to, to end where you want it to end, but you have to do it anyway because it's your best option. You know, and and. It's one of the things I try to keep in mind when I'm counseling somebody in that place. So I'm sure you got a biblical verse for that. Well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what came to mind when you said that, you right. know, and this is, you know, uh, I, we appreciate James's expertise, you know, it ties into that old Chinese proverb. What I hear, I forget. What I see, I remember. And what I do, I know. So uh, we're, you know, we're in a good place here with our friend. But... The first thing that came to mind was Paul's decision to appeal to Caesar, right? thinking that that was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But it ended up leading him to martyrdom. Right. 
Right. Now, in the grand scheme of things, of course, you have God's divine will, which is the big umbrella. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, of course, coming at it from a theological perspective. Right. And then you have within that some other umbrellas. One of them is his permissible will. Mm -hmm. In other words, we do have the ability to choose and select right. certain things and to kind of rudder steer a little bit. But, but right. his, his divine will is set, and that's not going to change, right. you know, so. Uh, but, what was it that said, uh, man plans, God laughs? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's one of the things that we see with people with anxiety, right? It's like things aren't going according to their plans. They're trying to control too many elements in their life. And one of the things that we try to get them to realize is like, yes, to some extent you can manifest things in your life, good and bad especially if you're not paying attention. But for the most part, like back to the battle within, what you're really trying to control are, you know, the thoughts and the actions. And, you know, it's, it's simple, but I think it's like every simple thing. Simple things aren't easy. Simple you things have their complex side. Right. Yeah. That's so true, too, with even with Torah study. You know, you have the... Right. The Peshat, the simple, the Ramez, then you have the the uh, the Drash and then the Sadi, and each step along the way is a more in depth look. Yeah. You know, yeah, the surface level stuff is basically that's it. Right. But then diving down and getting, you know, digging as for, for hidden treasures right. brings you to sure. all these other things, you know. So but one of the things that Carl Jung said was that um, judgment the ability to be non-judgmental is one of the most difficult things that we can take on and actually achieve. And like, if you think about it, I mean, human nature, I mean, we're, in, in many ways, we're, well, judgment's a survival mechanism. I mean, if you think about it, it's like, you know, um, I'm walking down the street, I see somebody dressed up in dark clothing, kind of judging that I don't want to be walking on the same side of the street as them, right? You know, and, and it's like, I'm walking through the woods, I hear a noise. Kind of judging that whatever that noise is that I hear could kill me. You know right. what I mean? Sure. So, so it's like, you know, judgment is a survival mechanism in that way. It's like, but, but how, do we, how do we become, how do we turn it off in a relational sense? Especially when we're sitting with people that we just outright disagree with. Yeah. It's not an easy thing. Not. No, but it sounds it. It's like, oh, just don't judge. Right? Yeah. Give it a shot. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and, and you know, everybody has struggled with that. And I'm sure even Paul himself, you know, he, he encouraged the judgment of matters. Right. Like circumstances. He discouraged the judgment of other people. Right. Because what he says in Romans is, you know, do you say that a man shouldn't steal? Do you steal? You know, do you say that a man should not covet? Right. Do you covet? Right. You know, so, wow, you know. And also he he goes into a, uh, an interesting place where in Galatians, I believe it's chapter 6, where he says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, mm -hmm. what he's saying is that we can all be overtaken in a fault. Right. Ye which are spiritual, mm -hmm. restore such a person in the spirit of meekness, mm. lest thou also be tempted. In other words, <laughs> it, if it weren't for certain circumstances, you could be in the exact same place. Right. You know, myself in the profession I'm in now, you know, so many times as a young man, that could have been me. Right. Right. Very it's easily. Me. And I strayed yeah. from the path a couple times. Right. You know, and, and if I had the opportunity given to me to apologize to each and every person I've ever offended, Mm -hmm. I would do that, right? And I would do it right away. I, I don't know that God will allow me right. to to revisit all those people, mm -hmm. but you know, if it ever happened. But but anyway, getting back to you know what we were talking about. So when we're passing judgment on a matter or a circumstance, we almost have to try to show our humanity in a sense, become humane for a second, right? you know, and not place ourselves on a pedestal because we're either in a position of authority, right, or because we wear a badge or whatever, right. you know. 
So back to Rogers. Empathy. Yeah, back to Rogers. Empathy. It's um, you know, it's another one of his core conditions of, of of a therapeutic relationship is that you know you have to be able to completely understand to the best of your ability what it's like to be that other person in that situation. You know, and that. You know, as a, as a therapist, it's what you practice, especially when you're talking to somebody that you can't, you know, really relate to or you don't remember. If I'm sitting with somebody who's like a 15-year-old girl, for example, you know, and she's struggling with what it's like to be a teenager now in the modern day with social media, with COVID, with, you know, the, the wonky stuff going on in school. And it's like, I have to listen. And I have to listen and try to listen as her, not as me if I was... In her position but listen as her like if, if I was her in every sort of every every way that I know to be her and I listen to her you know what would I feel and if I can reflect that feeling and we can discuss those feelings then it, it, the interesting thing is is it's it's tremendously curative you know in ways that are almost spooky great spirit grant that I may not criticize my neighbor until I have walked one mile in his moccasins. In his moccasins? <laughs> I like you that. Know, I mean, like, right. like, you know, something like what Magua would say. Magua. Right. <laughs> anyway. I so. like that you brought Magua in. That's great. Um, uh, <laughs> anytime you can put a movie reference in, you know I'm game. Um, right. Uh, uh, but, but it's just, it's so interesting to me that that when you are able to empathize with somebody, you know, it changes your perspective, sometimes almost entirely on, on, on issues and even internal core beliefs that, that uh, you didn't think were, were changeable, you know. Um, I don't want to get too deep into this, and, and I certainly don't want to get too deep into political issues or what has become political issues, but uh, when, when I worked uh, with a clinic working with undocumented immigrants, um, you know, I didn't have much of a perspective on immigration before that. I didn't really think about it, if I'm being honest. And I know that sounds insensitive, but I didn't really give it much thought. But then, when I sat down with people who were undocumented, and I heard about what their experiences were like in El Salvador or Guatemala or some border town in Mexico and you know I could actually sit with them in their pain and experience what they experienced you know it's one of the reasons why they talk about vicarious uh, trauma it's something that happens with therapists you know you you can't sit down through that and not have some sort of transformative experience um, if you're listening correctly you know so again someone that I would not see myself having too much in common with prior to meeting with them, sitting with them, listening as a way to, to, to try to embody what it was that they experienced. And wow, at the end of it, it's just sort of like, you know, it's hard not to be on someone like that side. And again, I don't want to get too political about it. Oh, I can but, imagine. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and bear one another, another's burdens. So fulfill the law of the Messiah is another passage, you know. Um, and it's, you know, it's so easy to, and again, 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 getting back to the externals and the internals, it's so easy to forget, you know, right. like we discipline ourselves and here again, like an athlete, mm -hmm. like a soldier, right. Uh, but yet we still, we're flawed. We, we, are. we forget, we make mistakes mm -hmm. and, um, we don't, sometimes what we do is intentional. Sometimes. Right. But I think that the the you know most important ones to try to avoid are the intentional. Sure. You know because well every law that's written is almost always written. Uh, there are some exceptions, but just about every federal statute and the statute, the general statute in North Carolina, it begins with if a person knowingly and willfully. Right. The first two elements of the crime. Sure. If those two elements are not in there, it's not a crime, mm -hmm. you know, for, for, for obvious reasons, you know. Sure. Uh, but, you it know. Is, it is still, uh, uh, and I'm sorry if I interrupted. No, you. no, you didn't. Go ahead. Um, 
it is still incumbent upon us, and I think this goes back to sort of radical responsibility, uh, to get in touch with the things that we don't intentionally do, you know, because we have to be aware of those things. Sure. You know, sure. There are things that happen subconsciously, even, you know, if you ever read Jung or Freud unconsciously, you know what I mean? Um, but so how, again, it goes back to honesty and truth. It's like, if you can get in touch with those things and understand why it is that you act those things out, then it's unbelievably curative. And that's why we'll, we'll just also toss on the table how important it is to be rightly related to our Creator so that He can enlighten us further in our development and help help us stay on that path. You right. know? Well, you have to have an open mind to it. Sure. Yeah. Sure. You know, it, for those who want to believe, you know, I, I respect right. that everybody has their own, you know, little spin off. But it's a funny thing because I certainly spent much of my 20s relatively nihilistic you know just being honest and it's something that I work with with uh, with people a lot I mean so many of the people that I see are who are mainly suffering the most are the people who are most nihilistic you know and it's because if you deny meaning if you pretend there is no meaning and you don't act in a meaningful way all that's left is you're bothered, irritated, suffering, incapable of, you know, developing uh, effective coping strategies for the things that do go wrong. And all you're left with is the suffering and the wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I had, to, I had to learn that the hard way. But I think the fact, I don't regret it, because I think the fact that I lived in that sort of nihilistic space for an extended period of time allows me to understand again, to, to, to empathize with the people that are going through it, you know, and, um, you know, and to show them that when they start acting out something akin to what they find meaningful in their lives, the suffering tends to be reduced. I wonder why. And, you know, the other, the, the other <clears throat> side to that, which that's a great point, is that, you know, when a person's suffering is reduced because they're acknowledging the reality of a creator, um, they have a tendency to have, you know, what the scriptures say, grace dispensed to them. Hmm. So that no matter what it is, like for example, Paul. Okay. When Paul wrote Philippians chapter 4, which is considered the mental health chapter in the Renewed Covenant writings, in, in, in what people, Western Christianity, to as the, the New Testament. I will have to take a gander. It, it's, it's, it's a great chapter because he wrote that while he was in a dungeon. Wow. Awaiting to be executed. Wow. <laughs> but it's because it's the mind. Here we go again. Right. You know, it's the mental state right. that allows you to be wherever you want to be. Right. Regardless of the circumstances around you. Uh, and wow, how powerful is that? Well, it is because you know it, it, there's this strange parallel between that and and the life of uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, right? Who was was uh, imprisoned in in the gulags uh, in in the Soviet Union, and you know it's so funny that uh, when when he was released from his captors, I forget how he, I think he spent about ten years in there. Um, he essentially started writing the documents that would undo communism in Russia, you know? And it's like, it's amazing, but it, it goes back to, remember before we were talking about amazing. radical responsibility? Yeah. One of the things that, that he did in, um, oh, what book is it? Oh gosh, it begins with Gulag, Gulag Ar Archipelago, yeah. Um, one of the things that he writes in there um, is, is that he had to, uh, in many ways against everything he felt, he had to realize how his actions led him to be where he was, you know? And it's like, it's, again, you want to get away from victim blaming if you're in my profession, but the fact that he was able to do that on his own 
that is something I think is very akin to divinity. Sure. You know? What came to mind when you mentioned Alexander right away, Solzhenitsyn, yeah. was Yosef and the Torah. Yeah. Joseph. Yeah. You know, he was again arrested, thrown in a dungeon for 13 years for something he didn't do. Right. But when he was released, mm -hmm. you know, that was the groundwork that suffering, right. temporary, although it seemed like probably seemed like forever for both of those guys. Yeah. There was a reason for it. And it was it was the ground laying the groundwork for a greater thing that they were going to be a part of, right? You know, and in his case, it was he was basically, according to Pharaoh, the savior of Egypt, right? And when when here's a, he goes from Hebrew slave and Hebrew prisoner, right, to Pharaoh saying in the Torah, when that chariot rides by and Joseph's in it, bow the knee, right. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I do. So, that's so, one of the yeah. stories I remember, though. Actually, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's it's so interesting that you can. But but I think it, it it's interesting. It's like you know, so often we we're we're so uh, enmeshed. I think is maybe the word with with where we begin, you know, or or you know uh, the things that happen to us and where they put us, and. Uh, for some reason, it, it, maybe it's maybe it's related to the addiction to destination. Like we have to get to this place, yeah. you know. But to me, I mean, and, and I think it's not just me. I would say it's it's most people, um, definitely most people living in Western civilizations. Uh, we're attracted to the story of the person who comes from meager beginnings. They don't have to get to the pinnacle, but they have to, in some way. Uh, uh, endure whatever it is that, that, that put them there or kept them there and rise out of it. And, you know, uh, as they rise out of it, as they, they, they emerge, you know, every single person, whether we're reading a book about it or we're in a theater watching it, you know, we get that tingle up our spine. You know, we get that warm feeling. That we're inspired. Inspiration. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, so yeah. I like that. I appreciate it. And, yeah. uh, you know, let's, uh, let's uh, delve more into this at a later time. So Definitely. Would. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. your time. Thanks for doing this, Nick. Yes, sir. Appreciate I appreciate it, it man. I appreciate you. Yes, sir.